Okay, good morning everyone um, and a very warm welcome to uh, workshop three of the conference uh, today, which is focusing on communities and community responses to the coronavirus. Uh, my name is Fiona Garvin, uh, I work for the Scottish Community Development Centre, SCDC, and I'm also privileged to be a board member of the Poverty Alliance, and it's in that capacity that I'm chairing this morning's session. So before we start, if you don't mind, I'll just go through some housekeeping with you. Um, the session will run from 11 to 12.15 this morning, and then there'll be a break when people can rejoin the session at one o'clock this afternoon for the panel discussion. If you've not registered already, you can still do so. Um, could I ask you again that while the speakers are on, can you keep your cameras off and also keep your sound on mute? It just helps with any background noise and keeping the cameras off protects some of the bandwidth. So if I could ask you to do that, if you haven't done that already, that would be really helpful. Um, we're going to hear some presentations first uh, and they'll all run one after the other and we'll reserve all questions until the end of the session when all the speakers have spoken. Uh, and when we're going to the question session, I would ask if people could post their questions in the chat function. Uh, and also if you could make sure that you click that they are sending your question to both panelists and attendees and that way we can see that there's, if there's any repetition. And what Peter will do is gather them up and send them directly to me and then I'll pose the question on your behalf to the panellists. Um, if we don't get through all the questions, we'll, like in the last session, we'll have a record of them all and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to respond to some of these after, after the event. And just a quick reminder that uh, we're recording the session today. So, as I say, welcome. Um, as we've heard this morning, uh, COVID-19 has shone a light on the inequalities in Scotland and, and amplified them. Uh, but in the midst of the crisis, we've also seen people and communities coming together, uh, often providing a first response, uh, working in an agile way to get to people to support them in their communities and in their places, often in the front foot and supporting the mitigation of some of the worst effects, particularly early on while some of the bigger systems uh, weren't as agile and, and couldn't move so quickly. And we heard this morning from, from Derek and Zahada uh, just how important some of those community responses were for them as individuals and we know that they've been incredibly important to vast sections of our population in Scotland. So the purpose of today's workshop is to think about how we can build in this and turn some of those kind of like your responses into further action for change. And in the workshop this morning, what we're going to do is cover some examples of how communities have been central to the response in COVID-19. Uh, we'll look at some of the factors that have both enabled that response, but in some senses have inhibited that response. And finally, we're going to look at the lessons uh, and what the prospects are for building in this for some future action. So we were going to be hearing from Jimmy Wilson from Fair Scotland uh, first this morning. Uh, unfortunately, Jimmy has actually contracted COVID-19, but he's absolutely fine about letting everybody know uh, that that's the situation. He did want to come ahead and, uh, and do the presentation, but we would advise him not to. Um, but he's prepared a video which Peter's going to show for us. Um, first of all, we won't be able to take questions, but as I say, when we come to the questions, but if you've got questions for Jimmy, I'm very sure Jimmy will be responding to them after the event. So. Uh, we're going to kick off with the video before we then move on to, to Danny Boyle and colleagues fr from Bemis and then uh, Pippa Kutz from Carnegie Trust. So, Peter, can I come to you to ask you to run the video first of all? You can. As soon as I find where the video is, I will um, show it. <laughs> Thank you. This is proving to be not my morning for technical issues. Um, here we are. Peter, I don't think we've got sound. Yeah. 
Peter, I'm wondering if we can maybe move to Danny and then we could show the video at the end. Yeah. Okay, folks, apologies for that. We'll kind of work in the background to try and get the technology sorted. Can I move on to Danny Boyle, who's going to be our first speaker, and he's going to speak along with David Chuck Wujiku, uh, who's an international youth ambassador, and Jenny Keenan, who's a manager of Perth and Current Conrose Minorities Community Hub. Uh, Danny's from Bemis, and he's going to concentrate on and, uh, the BME response um, to the coronavirus pandemic and uh, also the work in particular of the Ethnic Minority Resilience Network. Uh, Danny's going to draw on wider lessons about how the BME community uh, responds generally around issues of poverty. So Danny, could I hand over to you, please? Thanks very much, Fiona. Cheers. Uh, good morning, everybody. And i uh, just like to pass our best wishes initially to Jimmy. Um, that, that, you know, that's obviously very concerning news to hear that. So we, you know, as I'm sure it goes without saying that we all send him our, our best regards. Um, yeah, nice to meet you all. My name's Danny Boyle. I'm the Parliamentary and Policy Officer uh, with BEMIS Scotland. BEMIS are a national uh, race equality organisation. Um, so I'm speaking with two hats on today, obviously that, but also as coordinator of the Ethnic Minority and National Resilience Network. So I'm going to give a wee bit of background about what that is and why we set it up. Uh, but first, I would like to say I'm joined today by two colleagues from two other organisations. Um, so David from Intercultural Youth Scotland uh, and also uh, Jenny from Perth and Kinross Minor Minority uh, Communities Hub. So they are reflective of uh, the union of community organisations who, who came together as part of the Ethnic Minority National Resilience Network to respond to the health and social and medical impacts of COVID within, within our communities. So what they're going to be able to do is provide um, uh, case study examples um, from a, a young BME youth um, perspective and also from uh, the area of Perth and Kinross and the specific demographic challenges which have occurred there. Um, so what is the Ethnic Minority National Resilience Network? So we knew <clears throat> as we tracked the virus impacts, particularly by the time it got to Italy, um, we knew that the different the types of demographics who were being disproportionately affected by uh, the medical and social impacts of the virus were um, older people and people living in pre-existing uh, areas of inequality, social and economic disadvantage. So we knew that there was a high likelihood um, that the virus, both socially and, and in a health perspective, would have a really serious consequences for Scotland's uh, black and minority ethnic communities. Um, so we decided at that point, so that would have been, uh, I think it was a week beginning the 10th of March, so just a week before full lockdown, we did a sort of uh, assessment of our members across Scotland to see, um, you know, what their concerns and, and worries were, and it was deeply concerning some of the, the information we started to get back. There was already uh, issues of community transmission within some highly vulnerable groups who were already uh, having to access uh, third sector community support, food banks and, and other such examples. Um, so we decided at that point that we had to set something up uh, which was new and innovative and be able and be capable of responding to, to at that stage we weren't sure exactly what was coming but we knew something really serious was coming uh, so we set up the Ethnic Minority National Resilience Network. So that's a union of minority ethnic uh, organisations across Scotland who represent different communities on the basis of colour, nationality, ethnic or national origin. And we were really keen to see a uh, collaboration uh, and empathy and solidarity between all of these different communities and organisations moving forward through the pandemic, but also to act as a collective voice for developing intelligence on the different impacts within different groups but as a way to also advocate to, to government and local authorities and other decision makers about the specific material support that was required in order to respond to the different issues which were affecting uh, different communities at that time. So that, that's where the Resilience Network came from. And I would like to you know, take this opportunity in the, in the spirit of recognising the vitality and incredible response from communities to pay tribute to all of those members. So there's 86 members at present from across the country, um, incredibly diverse. And what they have done in order to 
to support uh, their own communities and, and the more broader community has, has been absolutely astounding. So I'd like to place on record our, our thanks to them for doing that and their continued support. Within the context of the pandemic, you know, it's hard to assess, uh, you know, outcomes from it because we're still right in the thick of it. You know, so we, our, our situation hasn't necessarily changed yet. We're still having to respond to the same concerns which occurred in, in March around about the expansion of, of destitution, around about the massive increase in, in mental health support required and also access and uh, state support, which I'll come to talk to, uh, because that has been a, a really critical issue over the last six months, which specifically affects uh, some black and minority ethnic communities in a very specific way. Um, <clears throat> so on that, what we saw right at the start was this expansion of destitution. And what Kat was characterised by was what is now we would recognise as, as the perfect storm. So th there was inequalities which existed prior to COVID and COVID just was like throwing dynamite into a tinderbox. It just exacerbated them. So there was a massive acceleration of destitution. And that perfect storm, as, a, as an example, uh, centred around about this issue of no recourse to public funds. So what we had is people from black and minority ethnic uh, communities who are more likely to live in overcrowding, more likely to work in low paid jobs, more likely to live in social and economic disadvantage and have very, very precarious employment circumstances. So on zero hours contracts, all of these things, which I'm sure many, many here are aware of. The added dimension for a lot of them, however, is not only are they on precarious contracts, they're also subject to an immigration system which designates them as no recourse to public funds. So when different sectors were collapsing due to full lockdown and that, that issue is beginning to reoccur again, we had significant numbers of people across the whole country um, who were not being furloughed because they didn't have permanent contracts and then had no recourse to public funds, no universal credit, no benefits of any type whatsoever. So that is... Um, you know, that's a terrifying situation for people to be in. And, and that's what we witnessed the current. We witnessed a, a significant expansion in destitution. So how did we respond to it? Um, you know, via the intelligence, which was developed by the myriad of communities involved uh, within uh, the resilience network, we were able to identify individuals and able to identify families who were affected by it. And we took that intelligence to colleagues in the Scottish Government and made the case that we had to set up an emergency sustenance fund. Now there currently remains a sort of political tension between the Scottish and UK governments around about this issue to no recourse to public funds, i.e. if the Scottish Government were to provide uh, a benefit payment or a discretionary payment, which we argue is within their gift, uh, to those subject to no recourse to public funds, would it affect their immigration status and their applications? Again, our position is these are two separate streams of work, so it wouldn't affect them. But while we're in that sort of um, stagnated position, we didn't have time to wait for that political argument to be come to an end or for it to be taken forward. So we made the case that we needed money in order to take forward an emergency sustenance payment and bypass that. And that's what we did. And we ended up having to support 891 referrals across the whole of the country, the vast majority of whom had uh, no recourse to public funds. <clears throat> so these issues are continuing. They're, they're, they're not stopping. At the moment, so we're continuing to campaign that the issue around the no recourse to public funds is responded to and that Scottish Government uses its uh, devolved powers in order to take that forward. There's a lot more I could, you know, talk about, but hopefully we'll get the opportunity within the, the question and answer session. Um, again, if anybody wants to continue this conversation and, and learn more about Resilience Network and what we're doing moving forward, uh, I'll put my email in the chat and you can contact me directly. But I think it's very important that we hear directly from our two case studies. So it's my pleasure to welcome uh, David Chukujeku from Intercultural Youth Scotland, who are an organisation doing incredible work uh, for black and brown and African and Asian uh, young people across Scotland and, and have done great work in responding uh, to the pandemic and, and the issues which affect them. Uh, particularly also, you know, for, for these people, young people, it wasn't just the pandemic, it was also happening against the backdrop of, of Black Lives Matter and the huge 
increase in recognition of institutional racism across uh, across the world and, and within the UK and within Scotland. So I'd like to welcome David and uh, pass over to him just now. So thank you all for listening and look forward to the, the discussions. Um, thanks very much, Daniel. Yeah, hi, I'm David Chukajeku. I'm an ambassador from Intercultural Youth Scotland. So over the COVID-19 pandemic, we had quite, we had our job cut out for us, the same as any organisation going through um, the same situation would have. We work specifically with young Black and people of colour, Scot Scots, and due to that, we had to consider the fact that alongside the pandemic, there was also the issue of exam results. And also there was the issue of Black Lives Matter happening at the same time. So we kind of, we had to like figure out the best way that we could be as dynamic as possible. So we could engage with the young people and give them the help that is necessary exactly where they need it. As obviously, every, like we've all stressed, um, and Daniel has said this already, there's a, dispro this, there's a disproportionate eff effect of the pandemic on people of colour and that's evidenced in statistics. So with young people not really understanding what the basis of this was at the beginning of the pandemic alongside having this information, we thought it was quite important that we were building their mental resilience and through the um, COVID-19 crisis we tried to cater specifically towards the mental health of our young people and making sure we can keep them mentally robust. So we began things like our youth club, which we've always found to be great for engagement with the young people and a bit of an escape from various um, personal like living situations. So we moved that online because we then saw that as a way to not only offer the, this engagement for the young people, but also for them, for us to have another outlet to spotlight young people of color who are, you know, working to carve their own path. So it gave us a chance to a keep the engagement up for our young people and give them something they can still look forward to, even if they are in a lockdown. As well as, um, yeah, so. <laughs> So apart from that, we also started a couple new groups that ran through the pandemic, like our girls group. Um, and at the time, we managed to get participants from all over Scotland to join in. And we felt we realised that a lot of the young people really craved something like that, because especially in minority ethnic communities or um, black and people of colour communities, which is how the terminology that we prefer to use, um, you find that there is a lot of um, kind of community poli politics and like dense kind of living situations. And the idea of a pandemic that means you only are able to have any sort of freedom if you have your own outdoor space created a lot of new restrictions. So we focused a lot on counselling at the time and that's something that we continue to do because we, th we think it's important that um, young people interact with counsellors that are that have similar lived experience to them um, because like young people are quite delicate it's quite important for, for them to be engaged as much as possible for them to be with people that understand where they're coming from what they're going through which is where we come in because we're youth led like we're not all old we're not we're not old yet like I'm not I'm not the youngest but I feel like we can, we still have the ears and we still have the eyes and we're still able to relate to them in a way that makes them want to engage with a service rather than because they don't see it as a service, they see it as a community. Um, get back to the notes here. And uh, following on from that, we carried out our COVID and colour report. Um, so this was just findings into how the young people actually felt during this time and we've posted that on our website, which is available for people to see. We've also flagged it up to Scottish government, as well as provided long lists of recommendations of ways that we feel that we could better engage with young people to avoid having the future generations of Black and people of colour Scots falling into the same traps that have kind of kept the systemic issues ongoing. Um, I'm, trying, I'm conscious of how much time I've got here. so. Um, I'll just round up 
um, I'll just round up quickly there by just talking about, yeah, sorry, no, I'll just round up there. David, thanks very much for that. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jenny Keenan uh, from PCABS. Now, uh, PCABS have been doing some incredible work um, for a slightly different constituent group uh, from the BME communities, so Eastern European um, migrants who have some very specific challenges with regards to social and economic disadvantage and poverty and, and the impacts of COVID. Um, so, Jenny, thanks very much for joining us, and I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Danny, and, uh, and thank you to, to Fiona for having us. Um, yeah, Danny had asked if I would speak a little bit quite specifically about the COVID outbreak at the Two Sisters plant in Cooper Angus and the response locally to that and how it affected the community. So, um, but rewinding a little bit, um, as Danny said, I'm the team leader at PCAB's Minority Communities Hub. So we are an organisation who support ethnic minorities in Perth and Kinross. So um, there's lots and lots I could say. I'm going to try and be quite focused um, for time, but I just wanted to share a little about the Perth and Kinross demographics to start with, to, to give a little context. Peter, if you wouldn't mind sharing the slide that I shared with you earlier, if we're able to. That's the one. And if you could just click so that the next reanimation comes up. And again, that's perfect, thank you. So this is just a wee map of Perth and Kinross to give a little bit of context for, for the area we're working in. So approximately 11% of the population of Perth and Kinross are from minority ethnic communities. As Danny mentioned, primarily Eastern European. Uh, the Polish community is by far the largest minority community in Perth and Kinross though increasingly closely followed by the Bulgarian and Romanian communities, which are the fastest growing. There are also smaller communities um, who are ethnically Chinese, South Asian and uh, Middle Eastern. Primarily ethnic minority communities in Perth and Kinross are concentrated in Perth City, which you can see, um, which you can see on the map there, but also in Eastern Perthshire and um, in Crete and some in Highland Perthshire where there is an agriculture and hospitality. So I'll talk a little bit during the case study um, about insecure employment and the impact of that in this case. But the reason I wanted to share this with you is you can see from the smaller orange areas, those are the three areas in Perth and King Ross which come up as pockets of relative multiple deprivation according to SIMD for those who are familiar with it. So they're the only areas which are sort of red and dark orange in Perth and Kinross. And I thought it was important to highlight just before I go on that those are, the, those are very much concentrated in the same areas that the populations that we're working with um, are living. I thank you Peter for that. We can, we can pop that down now. I'll carry on. So as I said, Danny asked me to speak a little bit about Cooper Angus um, and the situation at the Two Sisters plant. So for those who weren't familiar with it, it obviously was um, was my it was all consuming for me for about three weeks, but um, others others may have been less consumed by it. The Two Sisters Chicken Factory in Cooper Angus is a plant with about 1,200 workers, of which over 900 are um, migrant workers. It's closed for a fortnight due to initially four cases of COVID, which were identified amongst folk working at the factory. In the end, there were just over 200 cases. Um, and all factory workers and their families were asked to self-isolate for that entire fortnight um, and, and not leave the house. Of those workers, approximately 300 are contracted workers through an agency on zero hours contract, which as you can imagine, uh, threw up its own issues in terms of payment. So those who were employed by the factory received full pay for the time that the factory was closed. But those employed by the agency had a very different experience. Um, and I'll, I'll go on to that. The primary barrier in terms of getting information out was that um, somewhere in the region of 17 languages are spoken by workers in the factory. So again, whilst the biggest group of those three that I've identified, Polish, Bulgarian and Romanian, um, there are many, many other workers in the factory who, who speak different languages. So we had a lot of support from the Scottish government in translating information. 
So before I go on to talk about the key issues, just a little bit of context. We were invited by Beth and Kinross Council and the Tayside uh, Resilience Partnership to join those groups and be part of the response due to the demographic of the communities impacted, which was really valuable for us because it allowed a joined up response and we feel really valuable for the community because we were able to provide insight and information, as well as offering translation for things like immediate social media messaging to go out and play a part in that. I'd like to just go through some of the key issues that we came up against, and I, I do try to be solution focused, but due to time, I, I might have less time to go through in detail the, the solutions. But to, to make everyone aware of what some of the issues were, so obviously insecure employment, um, in particularly in rural areas like Devon King Ross, where there is such a reliance on agriculture and hospitality, is, um, is, is, is an issue. Um, and it is particularly an issue amongst migrant workers. In this in instance, the agency staff were, were told by the agency that they could apply for statutory sick pay for the time that they were off. And I'd just like to touch on the impact of that in terms of, so when we talk about no recourse to public funds, we often think about people's immigration status and we don't think about EU migrants and how, how they might be impacted by that. But those who, not been working for three months or more and um, fall under that category as well. So they are entitled to work, but things like crisis grants and statutory sick pay, there's not the same entitlement. So there was an immediate issue there where it took over a week to find out whether people would be paid or not. And then there was the need to put something in place to ensure that people had access to, to food and cash. Now, Perth and Ross Council were fantastic in getting food parcels out to everyone affected within that first week regardless of whether they had asked for one or not, all those households received a delivery where that was possible, which was, was a huge step in making sure that, that no one went hungry. But the additional level to that, so for those who could, for example, apply for crisis grants, um, that doesn't cover rent. So we're concerned about the problems that that's building up for the future, for those who then who then building up debt for those two weeks that they couldn't pay their rent. And for those who weren't eligible for a crisis grant at all, we were, we were fortunate that Danny and colleagues at BMS were able to work with us for the fund that Danny's already mentioned and ensure that people had access to that. However, the take up for that was actually very low. And our feeling around that is um, there was a combination of fears around status um, and, and what coming through welfare rights were the only people who could clarify for us whether someone had recourse to public funds or not um, would impact their immigration status or the WUSS application. I think this is being touched on. But also just getting that information out to communities. A lot of the communication that we had to rely on was digital and access to digital devices within new migrant worker commun uh, communities is, is scarce. Um, we were really keen to, to, to do that because the, the food parcels, as I mentioned, were fantastic, but we were keen on a cash first approach that, that um, prioritises the dignity of, of the people who are receiving that. The other thing I'd just like to touch on, um, and again, I'm conscious of time, so apologies if I'm speaking too fast, is, um, is overcrowding. There were several, there are several, um, properties within Eastern Perthshire, which house large numbers of workers from the factory. And what became apparent over the fortnight that people were asked to self-isolate at home was that people were actually sleeping in shifts in some of those properties. So those on back shift and night shift were actually sharing a bed with those on day shift. Um, and that's an ongoing issue and one that Perth and Kinross Council are continuing to deal with. But what I would say from our point of view is that overcrowding has been an issue um, in that region for quite some time. Um, and without pointing fingers at any one organisation, which is absolutely not our intention, um, for those invested in, in the factory being in the region, it's been overlooked for a long time because properties are scarce in the region and appro uh, appropriate housing is scarce. And actually it's, it's quite convenient. Um, to have it there. So that's something that we would be looking in the longer term to, to tackle. But on that, I will, uh, I will pass back over to Danny just to round off with some thank you again.
Thanks very much, Jenny and David. Um, I just finish off by saying thank you to, to both organisations for participating and just reaffirm that for us, collaboration through this crisis has, has been absolutely critical. Uh, it's been one of the most important parts of our work and, and with, with that in that spirit, I'd like to thank the Poverty Alliance and colleagues for inviting us along today and leave it open to everybody in attendance here uh, to continue these discussions with us either today but, but also going on into the future and to send our best wishes to you all in, in the time ahead. So thank you very much. Cheers, Fiona. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Danny. And, and thanks to uh, David and Jenny for outlining all the issues that, that you've been working to address and describing the way that you've been responding to them. Uh, and, and David, apologies to you. I think I introduced your, your job title wrong. It's Intercultural Youth Scotland Ambassador. And thanks too for the link to the report and the work which is in the chat. If people haven't already seen it, it's, it's well worth having a look. Um, I wonder if we can move on now to uh, Pippa Cooch from the Carnegie Trust. Uh, Pippa's going to do a, a short input for us on how communities and public services have been working together uh, during the coronavirus pandemic and what lessons we can take from that. And she's going to draw on some early findings from the Shifting Balance of Power project. So Pippa, can I hand over to you now? Hi, yes, I hope so. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> thanks very much, Fiona. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thanks uh, particularly to David and Jenny for, for their input there. That was that was really interesting to me, especially Jenny, because as you know, I live in Perth and Ken Ross. So I am a programme manager with Carnegie UK Trust. Uh, we work across the UK to promote wellbeing. We are a policy organisation. Uh, we also undertake some, some research and we've been working recently with New Local Government Network and Power to Change who support community businesses uh, in this project Shifting the Balance of Power. We've also been undertaking some of our own listening work where colleagues and myself have been speaking to areas, particularly towns, because that's where we've been focusing our energies in the last few years across the UK to try and find out you know, how people have been getting on during, during the pandemic, uh, particularly trying to learn around how communities and the uh, statutory sector have worked together. So I'm just going to feed back on, on some of that, uh, as Fiona said, but by way of introduction, I just want to flag some of the work the Trust has been doing since 2014 on changing the relationship between the state and communities to a more enabling state. In that, we're essentially saying that some parts of the state really need to change. I think as the cabinet secretary said this morning, we can't just go on doing what we've been doing because we know it ain't working. There's lots of people that, that are missing out that, that, that aren't heard. Uh, and for us really to change, what, we, what we're looking for is a situation where the state steps back in some cases and allows communities families, friends, community activity to step forward, giving people rights and giving people permission to take control. And I know that's not just going to happen. So we have uh, outlined a few steps towards that. So how, I'm just going to share those in my, by sharing my screen. So bear with me for a second until we get that in place. Okay, so I think now you should be able to see the seven steps to the enabling state. Um, I'm going to just shout at me if it doesn't look clear at all. Um, for example, sometimes it ends up showing the note pages, which you don't necessarily want to see. Not that there's anything very personal specific in there. So these seven steps to the enabling state uh, are really very much in line with what we, what Scottish Government proposed through the Christie Commission, which is, as some of you may be aware, coming up to 10 years uh, next year. But yet we've really seen over the last nine years how hard it is for local groups to be able to take control and to shape the services that they receive. And I think many of you on the call will, will understand that personally. And then I suppose COVID happens and that has led to a massive change. Suddenly the gap, I think, between the ambition and the implementation in terms of community action empowerment has shrunk, at least in, in some places. And in the past few months, we've seen what the state can do and only the state can do well. So setting up hospitals, shifting resources to the front line, even telling us all to stay at home. But we've also seen clearly what only communities can do locally 
So mobilizing, responding, the examples as Ira gave of, of the mosque in, in Glasgow stepping forwards, building on positive relationships and pooling collective resources. And in our conversations over the last few months, we've heard repeatedly about how the third sector and the community sector stepped up. And it was generally much more quickly than the statutory sector stepped up. And that's suppose, not surprising to those of us who work within the third sector. We know it tends to be more responsive and more agile. So we know the government made money available for emergency food distribution. We heard about that again earlier. And the only way often that local authorities were able to get that money and that food where it was acquired to the people that needed it was to access networks of grassroots community and neighborhood organizations. Particularly in some areas, there's been a recognition that people have struggled to ask for assistance. And so I think the sport needs to be and has been given in a way that supports individuals' dignity. And Jenny made that quite clear, I think, when she talked about how the cash first approach was adopted rather than just giving out food aid. And for that to happen, to support people's dignity, to, to understand about people's well-being, first of all, we need to ask people, what, what do you want? <laughs> what do you need? And in several areas, we found that food isn't necessarily what people have wanted or needed. Maybe that was true for the first two weeks immediately in lockdown uh, in the towns around the country. But as, as the crisis kept on going, as it unfolded, much more people wanted to have a chat, to have toys to entertain their kids when everyone's locked up at home, support to get online. And I think that's what's been really powerful about the community response is that they have started, community organisations, neighbours have started by asking what it is you want. They started by looking at the person, not by thinking about the service that's available. So we've heard about local businesses have stepped up, working with communities, a local chef who provided ready meals at £1.25 a portion, delivered them, a local chemist that made hand sanitizer, people connecting on Facebook, and people there from making uh, PPE equipment. In this picture, it shows the PPE equipment went to the NHS in Renfrewshire. In other places, it's gone to carers. And then all the social media groups that maybe many of you have been part of, Kinross Kindness, Loch Winnet Cares, numerous spontaneous groups that sprung up across the country. And groups which offered so many different sorts of support. In Loch Winnet, in Renfrew, they had Digging at Loch Winnet, where there was a YouTube tutorial by a grower who showed you how you could plant any green space you may have available, including public green space, areas of unused land, where perhaps the council, which wasn't able to during lockdown maintain, or perhaps hadn't been maintaining before. And they got money for seeds, for tools, for compost, they pulled people together and encouraged people to, to, to work together. Gardening in some ways, although it's maybe not available to everybody, has been a way it just brought groups of individuals, men in fact particularly, who don't always want to talk about their health, their well-being, their situation, to, together, to, to meet together. And I think the key point is that in many of these places there's been concern from the start about people who are going to be in financial hardship. So people who you've talked about a bit up to now today as well, people who necessarily weren't previously in a situation of being out of work. People necessarily don't know how to navigate the benefit system or how to navigate for support or how to ask for support. But the community sector has been very aware of that and has been thinking about longer term needs, whether that's around employment or, or around mental health. And then there's been the official volunteering. A particularly good example of that, I think, is the third sector interfaces coordinating volunteers and funding groups who previously had not been funded so helping them to be sustainable. And a real positive example of that is the community hubs that have been set up in some local authorities. Hubs are new structures that were based on existing relationships and values, and they're a rapid response. For example, in North Ayrshire Council, they set up their hubs as an emergency response even before lockdown started. And that was in six, six different localities, localities that had already been, had some partnership working within them. The hubs were flexible, they were responsive, they were looking at local needs, they were trying to understand what already existed in hyper-local uh, hyper level, so not to tread on people's toes. And there were strengthened partnerships, I think this is really key, 
the hubs that we have seen that have been most flexible and most uh, far reaching, I suppose, are ones where there was already some partnership between the community sector, uh, the third sector and the statutory sector. And it's led to co-location of the services. And it's also led to a greater understanding between the sectors, a real building of respect, I think, for the third sector, a greater understanding of the val value of volunteers and volunteering. Quite a few of the people we've spoken to about hubs, particularly in the third sector, said they feel the local public sector's confidence in the third sector grew through operating the, these hubs that provided support. Across the board, I suppose we've seen a fantastically different response to what we'd see in normal times. This 350 million emergency fund for communities, a relaxing of regulations, and I think this is important to learn from this rapid cost-free processing of PVG clearance for new volunteers. For example, the food train in Dumfries took on 548 volunteers to deliver food to vulnerable older people. Local authorities saying, tell us what you want, what you need, and we'll help you. So really being reactive and responsive. And pretty much all the tendering for social care has been paused in Scotland, and procurement guidelines encourage commissioners and providers to work together on a transparent basis. So overall, I think this is a quote that I've taken from a report that was done by partners of ours, a relationship project. And overall, I would say, I think in the pandemic, particularly for, I suppose, the emergency phase was very much a shared sense of having to tackle the pandemic and, the, and its impact together. At that phase, I think we really saw more compassion, more kindness, more empathy within our within our communities and why is that i think it's because as i said at the beginning there was something around the desire for people to be together even though we were physically apart that we all wanted to sort of support each other and there was also this consensus on this clear priority something i suppose you might say that we sort of aim that we shared in order to be able to survive and thrive during during the emergency there was a need for speediness to think and in some places that is really what enabled the state to let go a bit and allow the community in the third sector to step up and the risk i think was different one of the reasons that we find over and over again can't move towards an enabling state is the kind of risk adverse nature of many statutory services but at, in this point when the pandemic was the clear defining risk than other risk seems less dramatic in comparison. So the real question, and I think this is the question we're thinking about today, partly, is what do we do to make sure we don't snap back into how things were before? How can we realise the desire to do things, to do things differently? So here, I've, this is my last slide, and I chose this image for, for, for two reasons. One is something about the rug and the tea, although maybe not actually the mugs themselves, that remind me of years that I spent sitting cross-legged, drawing timelines in the sand and thinking about using the work of Professor Richard Chambers in community development and participatory methodologies. And I think one of the actions that we could take to enabling state is really to support communities and to make the promises of co-production come really to fruition rather than just being rhetoric and equal to support so individuals around co-production so self-directed support what's happened to that how can we how can we strengthen that and, and make sure it, it reaches more, more people and becomes more person-led the other reason i chose this image because i think having a cuppa signifies taking time perhaps even listening and sharing and that's what I think we need to do next, is to take a bit of time. Well, recently, we've been hearing in the Trust again and again from policy people, we need to slow down. We're subject to this raft of different outcomes, projects, targets, etc. Pilots, short term funding and the focus on outcomes. I don't know if it's really helped us make an impact on people's lives. So perhaps we should just reconsider where all these plans and targets have got us. I mean, I know, for example, Glasgow's got nine different plans that are uh, affect children's services alone. That's so many. It must be so confusing and so, so time consuming. 
So we need, I think, a transformation that makes it easier for councils, for decision makers to prioritise fewer boundaries, fewer silos, a bit more fluidity, a bit more listening. I think we need to concentrate on the longer term view to pick a main prize, to focus on it and to develop a pathway to change that we want, the change that we want to see. So thank you. Fiona, back to you. That. Okay, yes, thanks very much, Pippa, that was great. And a really important reminder there actually at the beginning of your presentation about, about what the state needs to do and, and can't leave and is not appropriate to leave to communities, but, but the real importance of recognising, supporting and resourcing uh, community efforts, because we now know we, we can't live without that, we can't do without that. And, and again, you know, sort of thinking about the, the purpose of this workshop, about lessons for thinking ahead, again, what you've described, Pippa, is that at a systems level, we can move fast when we can. So we don't have many excuses for as we move into the future. So thanks again for that. Now, I'm not sure what's happening technically with the video in the background, but what I would suggest is that we find a link and we send it around everyone, or maybe we can even put it in the chat at some point, because we're going to be a bit over time and we've got five minutes less for question and answers that, that, than we had projected. So I think it would be better if we could use the time for questions and, and just get a bit more participation and interaction. So um, as I say, if people could post their questions in the chat, we'll just allow a few to come through and um, see if we can kind of group them together some way. And also if you could put, if there's a particular question that you want to, sorry, a particular person that you want to pose your question to, that would be helpful for us too. So I'll just give you a minute or two just to start putting stuff in the chat. And again, if you could put it to everyone so that we can, we can see the, the threads, uh, you know, that come through if, if there are any. Okay, I can't see much coming through in chat. Is, everybody, is that because everybody's busy typing? I don't know, um, Jenny, Poppy has said something about um, concerns about the state letting go. Do you want me to say about that? Maybe yourselves or others? If you wouldn't mind, Pippa, I can't, uh, I don't know what's happening technically, but I can't see any questions in the chat function. So if, if we're seeing them somewhere else, if somebody could feed them through to me, that would be helpful. But yes, Pippa, would you mind responding to that one? Yeah, it might have been just a just a point, but I suppose I just wanted to re-emphasize, you know, I think in the in, in the trust and others, you know, like yourselves, SCDC, you know, we're not proposing here a kind of David Cameron um, new society sort of way way of being. And what we're talking about is really, I suppose you might say courses for horses. We know the stuff that the state has to do. So we're not saying the state, well, Carnegie anyway, is not saying the state is necessarily redundant, but we're saying there needs to be a, a re-emphasizing I mean, a bit like the cabinet secretary said this morning, at the moment, it's always, you know, come to the third sector, you know, after the fact. <laughs> um, and really the kind of assets of communities that have not always been understood or, or realised. And I think even just the diversity, you know, very good example about food boxes. I mean, how diverse were they? Not really. Uh, how person centred were they? Not really. So I think there's just something here about we're not saying this is the cheap way of getting services delivered. We're saying this is about making the most of people's assets. Okay, thanks, Pippa. Right, we've got a few questions coming now. We've got one from Fiona Sinclair there that's asking about the readiness of local organisations, um, you know, to, to, to continue to deliver and to help mitigate responses as we go into another kind of, you know, semi-lockdown. And, and, and asking some real practical questions about, you know, what's there for them. And I guess, I mean, we know that lots of people are fatigued, community organisations will be much the same, but I don't know whether any of the kind of speakers have got any reflections in terms of what they're picking up about readiness of their sectors and community sectors to be able to respond. Danny, do you want to have a, um, a quick go at that question? Yeah, I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. And I would like to link it to the No Recourse to Public Funds Challenge because 
it's a challenge now that isn't just a threat to the individual subject to it, it's, it's a public health threat to, to everybody. Um, <clears throat> communities have been pushed to, to, to extremes over the last six months, but in that adversity, we've seen some absolutely astonishing examples of, of communities coming together to respond to issues, and, and David and Jenny had outlined parts of that. So I, I think there's definitely uh, a six-month fatigue uh, which is, you know, is a recognised issue when responding to crisis situations. I can certainly speak from my own perspective. You know, the last couple of weeks where we sort of had this looming further lockdown restrictions, uh, you know, coming towards us, I've, 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 I've felt pretty down about that, <laughs> trying to, you know, get yourself re-motivated to, to go again because, you know, we've got another six-month block coming up. And I'm sure, and we know within our community member networks, that, that that's a shared feeling. So what do we need? We need material uh, support from the government where possible in order to begin to mitigate these issues to survive the next six months. So not even making the dramatic radical changes that we know we need to do in order to respond to ongoing and long-term social and economic disadvantage, but just to get through the next wee bit. And that's why the no recourse to public funds issue is absolutely critical. Um, our position to government, and I'll repeat it here for, for colleagues, is that we have the legal powers available to us to use the, our devolved benefit system and our devolved powers to make a discretionary payment to those subject to no recourse to public funds. Now they need to know that that would be in these individuals if they were told, OK, for the next 12 months, you're going to get a weekly or, an, or a monthly payment of X amount. That immediately takes forward issues around about mental health and gives them that opportunity and dignity and respect to have some access to money, which in order to live their lives, like Pippa had spoke about before, it's not handouts people are wanting, it's, it's the materials needed in order to survive this pandemic. And that's why the no recourse to public funds issue is, for example, preventing people from self-isolating. You know, if you're not able to feed yourself and not able to have the, the things necessary to, to live a life, then you go back to work or you, you do other things which maybe are not um, strictly in line with the facts advice or the self-isolation guidance. Yeah, so there's a six month fatigue, but we need uh, immediate action now that gives communities the things that they need just to get through the next six to 12 months. So that, that's what I would say on that. And that's what we will be trying to reaffirm to, to cabinet secretaries and government and this today and tomorrow and next week because we need action on it. Okay, th thanks for that, Danny. Uh, Pippa, rather than responding to the community readiness question or, or, or kind of like, you know, sort of covering some of what Danny's covered, another question has come in just about the readiness of the state, kind of in the lessons over the last six months. Now, you said you covered some of that in your presentation, but what evidence have we got actually that the state can step into the spaces they need to, do you know what I mean, kind of like as Danny's describing, to try and kind of get us through this? I think that's, I think it is a bit doubtful, uh, slightly, isn't it? Because of the history that we've seen, you know, the nine years since the Christie Commission, there's not been a lot of change. Uh, and I think we need radical change. I'm sure lots of people here agree with that. This kind of uh, going around the edges doesn't really, hasn't really done it. Um, I, maybe, you know, there are obviously loads of beacons of, of good health, of good, good health, of, of hope, I suppose. You know, for example, we, we've done some work, as many of you might know, in the trust around kindness. And that's promoting relational uh, services. So you know, really thinking carefully about how you, you relate to people and how you deliver services, not just what. Uh, and I think that gets us away from a lot of the kind of target tick box mentality. So I think, and there's a real interest in that, definitely. I mean, lots of people, you know, talk about what's happening in North Ayrshire or Wigan or whatever. So I think we need to really push that, that a bit further because there are, as you know, many people that work at the front line who are employed by the state, the public sector, that's what they want. They want to be much more of a, a relational uh, organisation. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. There's some stuff coming through in chat. Um, early, early on in the chat, Shelley Gray from Cora posed a, posed a question about well, how, how can we support communities better, given this is the, the focus of this workshop. What, what is it that we actually need to do to support them? And there's some chat going on. I think back, Danny, you're interested in hearing a wee bit maybe from Rona Arthur about the community hubs in North Ayrshire. Rona, are you there? Would you be happy to, to chip in and tell us a wee bit about, about what you've been doing in North Ayrshire and about the kind of supports that you think communities need to continue to be supporting, you know, at local people? 
Thanks, Fiona. I hope you can all see me now. Um, so we're very fortunate that we've got some very sophisticated, well-developed um, locality hubs. Uh, so Filton, Vineborough, Cranberry Moss and, and Whitley's and I guess we had a we had a long established relationship with them because they all started from um, that kind of community empowerment journey. So asset transfer, land transfer, Filton um, knocked down the, the existing community centre. It's our biggest area of deprivation. They built um, with a lot of um, support. They built a brand new centre, which was bespoke, fit for purpose to address some entrenched problems around about poverty, unemployment and, and poor health. And um, Donna Fitzpatrick is an absolute you know, power to be reckoned with and I know Barbara Connors on the call and she'll absolutely endorse that as well. Um, so they've 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 done a lot of work. Vineborough again, leadership round about the alcohol and drug support response that we need. Uh, Whitley's Cranberry Moss very much about food. Fullerton's been very active in that as well. So right from the get-go, we had our, our own six locality hubs, you know, local authority designed and built, gathering together that kind of whole systems approach. But um, Vineborough and Fullerton wanted to be right in from the, from the beginning. And I think we have to recognise that there are parts in our communities that the state can easily reach um, and that through that kind of empowerment and, and safety net and, a, you know, I kind of said nurturing parent type role, which sounds a kind of bit patronised, but, you know, it's like a teenager, you, you know, you're only there when they actually need you. So when they need money, when they need support with something difficult, like an application form, um, when they get tired, and, and people wear out as well, do you know? And it is it is phone calls checking on people that they're okay and that they're not worried about bills and that the guy that's that's got the photocopier contract isn't harassing them to death. Um, because these are things that, that, that are the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, I, I, you know, it is that kind of relationship and building that because it comes back from the way that they can reach into and build relationships with our communities. So I think a lot of the things that we need around about, and I hate it, but it is about this lottery external funding merry-go-round that a lot of them are on. And it is about setting up the kind of government funding which supports the third sector more sustainably. Um, so it is being able to get not just you know, a two year grant or a three year grant, it's about a 10 year partnership with some of these types of organisations that are doing so well um, for us and with us. You know, they're delivering local services just as, as genuinely as we are. Um, and I, I say I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but for me, it is about how we nurture that community leadership. And if we haven't got that there, then we need community development teams um, within our resources to be able to start to build that capacity. Thanks, Rona. I think some really important points there. And funding is always one of these ones where people roll their eyes over talking about funding again, but it's so critical in terms of how we shift investment towards communities as opposed to this kind of grant type relationship. I want to go back to a question, if you don't mind, um, that, that Peter posed um, in the chat, which is, is an important one. And it was about, you know, sort of we saw quite a dramatic rise in some of the mutual aid groups that popped up, but we've also kind of seen that die away, away a wee bit. And I guess for lots of us here who have been involved in, in kind of working in community life for a number of years, it is quite a different proposition um, to volunteer in, in a crisis, but to actually engage in that long-term community effort and, and community action. So, I mean, can, can any of the speakers give us some kind of reflection uh, about that? Do you know what I mean? And because in, in some senses, when we see something like that, of course we want to celebrate it, but sometimes it's, it's something that we start to build policy around where the, the foundations for it might might not be as as, as secure as we, as we would hope it would be. So I don't know whether either Pippa or, or, or Danny or, or David or Jenny or, or, or Rona wants to come back in just to kind of reflect on that or anyone else. If, if anybody would like to respond to that, just put your name in the chat. I just speak a wee bit on that in my with my third sector interface hat on, um, if that would be helpful. So PCAVS yes, Jenny, um, is also the, the third sector interface with everything. 
And I suppose the, the place to start there would be just purely due to capacity. I've had a big role in, in that team as well as my own since the start of the pandemic because we, we've needed the extra bodies. Um, and I think what you're saying about volunteering is, is really interesting. Yeah, do we then build, are we building on that as a backbone of, of community members? And it is often, whether in a crisis or during business as usual, is the same individuals. And so we've seen in Perth and Kinross somewhere in the region of a thousand people put their names forward to come and start volunteering during the crisis. And I would hope as the TSI never underestimated the toll that that can take on people. I know for me personally, and, and I'm, I'm being paid for my work, the toll on my mental health over the last six months has been, has been significant. But those who are still doing that, I would say a lot of them are the people who, who would have been volunteering before the pandemic. And, and for those who were on furlough, it was an excellent opportunity and they, they took up loads of volunteering and filled their time. And now we're seeing people rightly go back to work. And if we build on the assumption that that level of volunteering is in any way sustainable, I think we're setting ourselves up for a fall um, because of the mental health implications, because of the resilience implications, but also just because of the capacity and the fact that that capacity is not going to be there um, in the longer term. But I think Pippa would probably have more to to add on that as well. That's great, thanks Jenny. I mean, I think in my head, there's sort of two slightly different things here. One is the spontaneous community action and the other one is the volunteering. And I think the TSIs have played such a crucial and fantastic role in supporting the volunteering. And lots of people that I've spoken to have said, actually there has been a bit of a change in the volunteer profile. So people that had been volunteering for decades, let's say, uh, some of those were, were older and, and shielded. So now the volunteering profile has, there are younger people, they may not be uh, teenagers, I don't know, but they're younger people who are volunteering. And partially that was because people were on furlough, but places, TSIs, for example, I know Gage in Renfrewshire, uh, they've really been able to use that in order to build up their volunteering database. So they've asked people, would you be prepared to volunteer in the future? You know, are you really interested in COVID? Can we keep you on the database, etc.? So the nature of their databases has really changed uh, and it's expanded their database. So I think there is um, that sort of more organised by TSI's third sector volunteering. I do think there is hope for that in the future. Um, and I think it, it could flourish. The community action side, I mean, yeah, this six months fatigue thing is real. So maybe it will come back. And especially if we're able to put in place you know real supports around for example community asset transfer this is something really to rally around maybe but at the moment it's hard yeah I think in terms of it kind of takes us full circle into the funding argument I guess because some of the things that we were picking up in terms of community organizations while there can be an influx in volunteering the community organizations themselves have to be stable and have to have capacity to be able to respond to volunteers to be able to to support them with training and support them with you know, sort of safety, safety measures and so on. So again, do you know what I mean? We have to look at that as kind of part of the whole system, I think. I don't want to forget, but we're, we're running kind of like towards the end of the workshop, but something has you know, come up, uh, you know, from, from Zahada about uh, uh, black and minority ethnic youth employment. And Danny, I saw you making some responses about that. I mean, I think that's, you know, something that we need to kind of touch on, you know, in terms of the importance of that particular issue, in terms of how we move forward. Could you give us a wee bit of a response to that? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to say a very quick point on it, and maybe David would like to come in on that as well, or uh, is uh, Kalida potentially? Um, yeah, he would. So, uh, yeah, BME employment is, is, is an inequality which has pre-existed the pandemic and is exacerbated during the pandemic and is now in a critical stage. Our point uh, that we made to the expert reference group on COVID and ethnicity, uh, which we were, we were members of, and we've also made a number of, of, of verbal and, and written communications to the Scottish Government, is that we're not using the economic levers at our disposal to actually uh, credibly respond to the issue of BME, uh, lack of representation and different employment opportunities. And that's because our economy has fundamentally changed. Our economy has changed in the sense that um, our traditional employers, where we're looking for further representation, are in, are in areas of freeze or complete stagnation or declining. So if we look at the public sector, like Glasgow City Council, for example, there's a significant issue 
in terms of BME representation within that organisation. However, they're not recruiting in the same way they traditionally used to recruit. And that's reflected across a whole number of, of different bodies. <clears throat> so where are the big, massive economic uh, opportunities in order to try and see some traction and change? We missed the opportunities during the last parliamentary cycle um, where there was a, a, a commitment to build 50,000 new homes. Prior to that, and we argued from 2016, was that in developing and building those 15,000 new homes, part of the procurement process should have seen equalities uh, employment targets integrated into any contractual arrangements with contractors who would be taking forward that work and that we'd want to see on an annual basis for those from BME young communities who want to work in those sectors, that opportunities are strategically opened up to them. That's similar now for our capital investment projects moving into the next, uh, the next parliamentary stage and our continual position on that is that there has to be BME youth employment targets integrated into procurement processes across the board in order to use our economic levers to make those opportunities real for people. And that has obviously has to happen alongside uh, public bodies and other institutions making their, their workforces more representative where and when they can. So the specific strategic focus is not appropriately on where we're spending money and where we're driving forward employment. And that has to change. Otherwise, Zahad is entirely right. We're going to lose another generation and we're going to look at a census in 2022 and all the learning we get from it and ask ourselves again, why is there such a lack of uh, or a disproportionate lack of employment within specific ethnic groups? So yeah. that's what I'll say. OK, brilliant. Thanks, Danny. David, I wonder if you would come in finally for us and just give us a couple of minutes to answer Peter's question about how you think the young people that you're working with can continue to be supported to be involved, particularly seen, you know, given the, 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 the experience of the levels of activity around Black Lives Matter. Could you just give us a minute or two on that um, to just to finish this up today? Yeah, sure. Well, going forward, the ways that we think we can best support our young people are kind of through doing a lot of the same things that we already do, but trying to expand our networks, our networks, because like we've covered all through the um, conversation, capacity is one of the biggest kind of barriers that we face. And as an organization, which kind of ties back into a point someone made about like, if we had to skip, if we had to ramp up again, as an organization that went for a rapid expansion through the and COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter crisis, we, we have what, what we would, what we would say is we have the, we have the urge as much as like everyone else in that works in the sector and that like participates in community event and um, community drives. We have, we, we have the like urge to do it, but the problem becomes in capacity and how much funding is actually available and how, how much impact we're actually like who, whose ears we have and, how much they're willing to support what we're doing um yeah i think like going forward the best the best way that we can support our young people realistically is just by continuously engaging with them and trying to petition government or like funding bodies or just anyone who has a foot somewhere that can take forward our kind of not not our agenda but our mission anyone who can take that further, then what we need to be doing is building networks and building capacity as a wider sector. Obviously we work in kind of um, race relations, which has like overlaps of it with like poverty and other intersectionalities. But what we need to do is have a build a very resilient and expansive network that is funded adequately and has all the resources necessary to tackle a crisis that does seem to be moving in a slightly cyclical manner. Like, we don't really know what the future is going to bring. And I saw someone talking about the um, time, the extended timeline, and realistically, we don't really know what the extended timeline will be for this. So we have to have networks in that are able to deal with such a kind of dynamic and all-encompassing problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, th I think it's really important, a really important point to end on, David, is just about how we actually build infrastructure to cope with us in the longer term and whatever comes next. So um, we're just about at time. C could I just finish the workshop off then by thanking the speakers again, thanking Danny, David, and Jenny from Bemis and from the other networks and from, from Pippa from the Carnegie Trust. Um, Thanks for your input. It's been really, really helpful. It's been really interesting and it's been a really good discussion, you know, sort of 
uh, sometimes Zoom says it limit limitations, but some been great answers as, and to some great questions, and also some 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 good stuff going on in the chat, which is really helpful because we can capture all of that. I can also see that Peter has has put a link, so if people want to look at that link, please cut and paste it out and put it into your browser so that you can have a look at it and and it doesn't get lost. But I think it will come out in the, the kind of post conference materials. Um, just a quick reminder that the, the next session starts at one o'clock and it is through a separate Zoom link and a separate invitation. So if you haven't registered for that, I believe there is still time to do it. Um, so, so I would encourage you to do it and listen to what's going to be a really, really interesting panel discussion this afternoon. So if I could just say thanks very much again to everybody and uh, we look forward to having some really good, progressive, constructive discussions on all of these issues sometime again soon. Thank you.